Bring up the lights. And now, everyone, let's put our hands together and give a warm welcome to our moderator, Patrick Kelly. Hi. So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Patrick Kelly. I teach in the game development degree. I'm one of the overseers of Final Project. As you know, Mo, uh, Rooster Teeth has been here the last few days. They've been working with the students. And uh, in 2018, they're going to have a partnership with us. And that includes mentoring one of our Final Project teams. And that game is going to go to Austin for the indie game RTX in August. So we're going to uh, be talking to Gus this afternoon. He's uh, one of the founding members, as you guys should know, uh, of Rooster Teeth. He is going to be here talking about turning failure into success. So with that, let's give a round of applause one more time for Mr. Gus Sorolla. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, like Patrick said, I want to talk a lot today about every experience I've had failing in my life that has led me to this moment to be on stage here. Because I think that a lot of times we try to avoid failure, and you should try to avoid failure, but it's a good thing in the end because I think you can learn from it, and uh, hopefully it makes you a better person, and uh, you, can, you can take some lessons away from that. And I was talking with Patrick before we started here and about how lucky you guys are to have uh, a place like Full Sail where you can come and learn the things you're learning. Uh, when I was graduating high school, Full Sail existed, but I think at the time only did audio production. Uh, but they've really expanded and do a lot more. I, uh, when I was a kid, I wanted, to, I wanted to be a game developer. I think at the time, my dream was to work for Capcom because I was a huge Mega Man and Street Fighter II fan. Uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I told my teacher that. I was taking a typing class at the time, and it was on a, it was on a typewriter. We didn't even have computers. And <laughs> my teacher laughed at me and told me that there was uh, no future in that. So, in your face. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I did a lot of things when I was... A lot of academic competitions when I was younger. And uh, just because was, I, was, I was like the school nerd, and it was the thing that all the nerds did, right? We did like the math competitions and all the speech competitions. So I never really had a problem. From a young age, I've never really had a problem getting up and talking in front of a crowd. Uh, there was one competition I used to always do that was called extemporaneous speaking. And if you've never heard of it, it's, it's, I don't know why it's a competition. It's the dumbest thing in the world. You, you draw a random topic out of a hat, or some, a box, actually. You draw this topic out, and then you have 30 minutes to research it using materials you brought, and then you have to develop a seven-minute speech about it. And sometimes you would pull up a topic that you just had no idea about, and it was like, for seven minutes, you'd have to stand up and just kind of BS your way through it and, uh, and hope for the best. But my problem was all, in these competitions was always I would get through to the point too quickly. So I'm telling you this story now to pad out the speech so that it goes a little longer. <laughs> Um, so, I was born in Austin, where Rooster Teeth is headquartered now, but I didn't grow up there. I grew up in this really small town out on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, my parents were from Mexico, so they wanted to be back close to their family. So I grew up, and I lived there for 12 years, and like I said, it was, it was a weird town. Like I said, I took a typing class on a typewriter, and there was really nobody else who shared um, the kind of passions I did. I think I had one friend who played video games at the time. And that was it. We both had an NES, and we would trade cartridges with each other. Um, when I finally got old enough to, to go to university, I looked at a bunch of different colleges, and you know, I, was, uh, I was accepted to you know, a ton of different colleges, and I ended up going to Rice University in Houston because I didn't want to move too far away from home. Like I didn't want to go to a college up north because I wanted to avoid cold weather, and I assume you all are thinking the same thing if you're here in Orlando. Uh, <laughs> um, then, you know, after a year in school, this was in the late 90s, I decided that the internet was taking off. This was in 96, 97. And I thought, if I wanted to capitalize on the internet, and I wanted to capitalize on getting rich quickly, honestly, uh, <laughs> then I needed to, to make a dot-com, and I needed to find people who 
shared an idea with me. So I dropped out of school and moved to Austin and um, ended up living with a friend of mine. And uh, wor- nobody would hire me because I dropped out of school. I didn't have any real, <laughs> uh, real skills, just ideas. And uh, that's where I met uh, Bernie and Jeff at, the, at a call center. Bernie and Jeff are two of the other founders uh, of Rooster Teeth. And uh, that kind of leads to why um, sitting here right now talking is, uh, you know, we all started this company called Rooster Teeth. And in my presentation, I had a line to ask, you know, does, any, does everybody know what Rooster Teeth is? But based on the line I saw, I assume you all know. What, does anybody not know what Rooster Teeth is? People were tweeting me like at seven this morning, uh, images of themselves out in line. I was like, I'm still in bed. <laughs> Was, was it you? Yeah, it was you. I recognize you. And then uh, some, some people started sending me photos of their wristbands, and it said 11 a.m., yeah. and I thought it said ham, and I got really, ex- <laughs> I got really excited about that. Um, but I wanted to show a little sizzle. Uh, I, I had this prepared in case there was anybody here who didn't know what Rooster Teeth was, but I'm going to show it anyway. It's a little sizzle of uh, some of the stuff that we do to kind of help explain what it is that Rooster Teeth does. Go! Who wants to go first? Oh my god! Laser team, form up! Now that's rock and roll! Remember that time we wrestled each other? I just can't believe you're all finally here. I've never seen in my life. Someone here. Come here, motherfucker. Come here, it's a classic love tale. Come here, come here. 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 I landed in another plate, and it would be construction in the other plate. I never thought we'd get here. This is awesome. That was uh, awesome. Thank you for making this a real community. Thank you for making this amazing. So it's funny, I say that's a sizzle, but that was 2017. Like, all of that was, was one year. And uh, it's crazy to think the, the sheer volume of, uh, of content that we put out in one year. It's, uh, it's a little mind-blowing. Mind I, I don't understand how anyone can keep up with all of it. Um, so Rich Teeth obviously does a lot of different things. I mean, uh, and you saw it in that video. You know, we have live events, uh, live action videos, which include shorts, films. Uh, stuff like immersion, day five, animation, which can, you know encompasses uh, Red vs. Blue, Ruby, Rich Teeth Animated Adventures, Camp Camp, Genlock, Nomad of Nowhere, which those last two are coming out soon. Uh, then we have our broadcast shows, which encompass all of our podcasts. We, di- we, th- we, uh, we refer to all of our live streams as broadcasts, because really that's kind of what we've modeled uh, our live stream production after. It's taking 
broadcast methods. Anyway, uh, we also have merchandise for our online store. Uh, we do business, uh, business side of stuff as well, which you might not be as familiar with. We run a podcast network called The Roost. Uh, and then we have our Let's Play family for all of our different partners like um, Kind of Funny, uh, the Sugar Pine Guys, and, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> Game Attack, Screw Attack. Oh, Game Attack, Screw Attack's part of us now. Chat's back there. Um, so I was actually talking, now that I, I talk, now that I mentioned Chad, I was talking with Brian last night. Brian uh, it works in our game development department. Say hi, Brian. Um, we were talking last night about the, this is a little bit of a sidebar, about the number of people from Full Sail who work at Rooster Teeth. And I think Brian estimated we have about 25 people there. Yeah, thumbs up. About 25 people currently who came from Full Sail. And you see, like, with the breadth of things that we do, I think there's a variety of, uh, of degrees <laughs> that, you, that are provided here that lead into the kinds of work that we do. So... I want to talk a little bit about the history of Rooster Teeth. And, uh, you know, we started the company in 2003. So it's crazy to think that, you know, after 14 years, we're still putting out that much content, still have that much to do. Uh, it started off as a hobby in a spare bedroom. You know, we all had day jobs. Like I said, we all worked at a call center, but it wasn't, full, it wasn't creatively fulfilling. So in our off hours, we made websites. And so Red versus Blue kind of took off in 2003, and I immediately moved out of the United States. Uh, <laughs> I moved to Puerto Rico to be with my family for a year. Then I, I moved back to Austin in 2004 to help the guys. And, uh, you know, we had a, a couple of iterations. I think back then when we were working out the spare bedroom, there were about three or four of us who were working on it really all the time. Uh, we moved to an apartment in Buda. That was our first real office. We rented a one-bedroom apartment, and we were there for two years, and we grew the company to about six people there. Uh, then we moved to an office in downtown Austin. We were there from 07 to 2010, and I think we grew to about 12 to 15 people by the time we left there. Uh, then we moved to our Ralph Albanado office. That was from like 2010 to 2014. We grew up to maybe uh, by the time we oh by the time we left there, might have been 60 of us, I think, 60 or 70 somewhere in that neighborhood. And now you know we're in a, an, uh, an area we call Stage Five. And like I said, we moved, in, we moved into Stage 5 with about 70 people, and I think currently we're just over 300 employees, uh, maybe approaching 350. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been crazy growth, a lot of it here in the last couple of years. Uh, so, you know, the first, thing, first project we ever did was Red versus Blue, like I mentioned. It was a, an animated series that we wanted to make, but none of us knew how to animate. So we made it using a video game, and we all liked Halo at the time, so we, we made it using Halo. And, um, you know, we realized early on that the entire company was basically one product. It was red versus blue. So, you know, we worked really hard to diversify and add a bunch of other videos. And you can see now in our 2017 wrap-up, there's so many different um, videos that, that we have and so many different projects that we do. And I want to show, actually, one more video here before I get going. This is the, the very first video we ever made, which actually predates Rooster Teeth. We made this one in August of 2002. <laughs> Playing games on the PC was like... There are a lot of great games on the Mac. Like Warcraft 3... Um, that, that puzzle game with the Apple logo, that's a great game. I beat it, but it's, it's, it's still fun. The confusing thing about PCs is just, you go to the store, and there's just so many games. I mean, everywhere you look. But on the Mac, there's just six. And you know which ones are good, because you've already played them all on the PC, like five or six years ago. On the Mac, I can play plenty of great games that you just can't find on the PC now. Like Zork, Breakout, Super Breakout, Photoshop. Another great thing about the Mac is upgrades. On a PC, you have to open up your case, swap out your video card, change jumpers. On the Mac, when it's time to upgrade, you just pick it up, throw it away, and go buy another one. Now that's convenience. <laughs> My name is Gus Sarola, and I'm a gamer. Well, I used to be. So, I mean, that's the, the first video we made, and uh, again, I was talking to Patrick yeah. about this before we started, and that video is that only exists like in this little tiny 360p window. Like that's why it looks so crappy now on modern displays. There's no other way to, to watch it. 
And uh, if you pay attention to that video, anytime I look down, I'm actually looking at a script. There's like notes at my feet uh, like to, to tell me what to say. Um, okay, so I want to actually go back and revisit some of the things I talked about real fast before I go any further. I felt like, you know, I, I talked, what is it now, for like 20 minutes about how I got here, but it was always the positive notes, right? It was always the success and what worked and what didn't. So I'm going to go back and tell some of those stories where I failed and where I fucked up. <laughs> um, so growing up on the border was probably the worst thing that ever happened in my life. <laughs> um, like I said, I had one friend that we, we played video games with, and I was miserable. Uh, I was like ostracized because I wasn't born in that town, and everybody knew it. So I was always like treated as an outsider, and nobody ever accepted me. I say that. Then moving on, when I got to college, I say that I, I dropped out of college, but really my grades were terrible. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, this is like, it was like the kind of thing where, yeah, it's probably better if I just left on my own. Uh, then I moved to Austin. Well, then I got a part-time job doing beeper repair, because I'm an old man. Um, I saved up $500, and I moved to Austin with a guy that I knew, and I slept on his floor for three months. Um, and I couldn't find a job. Nobody would hire me because I had no skills. And it was, it was, I was literally at a point there at the, where I was out of money, and I thought, in the next week, I'm either going to have to live on the street or I'm going to have to move back in with my parents. And I was pretty sure I was going to live on the street. <laughs> um, and so it was literally like the, the, a Hail Mary. It was really pure luck. Uh, my roommate at the time went and applied for a call center job, and he didn't have a car, and I had this shitty little truck, so I drove him down to his interview, and then, you know, I took him back to our apartment. And then the next morning I woke up and I thought, well, that's dumb. I should have applied for that job too. So I applied for the call center job that day. And I got it and my roommate didn't. <laughs> and uh, it's because I got that job that I did, one, I didn't live on the street. Uh, and two, that I was able to meet uh, Bernie and Jeff, who also worked at the call center. And we were able to, to come together and um, ultimately make Rooster Teeth. But I say ultimately make Rooster Teeth because we had other projects that failed before we even got to that point. Uh, we were, like I said, we were working at the call center and the job was fine. It was a lot of hours, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of things that were repetitive. It was a lot of things that were really boring. And we, we all had kind of creative outlets that we wanted to explore that we weren't able to. Uh, at the time, so I met Bernie actually in January, or I met him in February of 98, wow, 20 years ago. And um, when I, I met Bernie, he was my boss. And then a year later in January of 99, Jeff started at the call center. And when Jeff started, he was running this, this zine about um, punk music. It was um, mildly popular. It got you know, some readers and he po posted it as a website. And I knew how to make websites because, well, I'll get to that later. Um, so I thought, oh, you also know how to make websites? Like, I know how to make websites. You know, we kind of were friends. So I said, well, why don't we make websites together? We said, great, you know, what are we going to do? So we started this uh, website we called uglyinternet.com. And what we would do is we would critique people's websites. <laughs> and then we would petition the American Registry of Internet Numbers to revoke their IP addresses. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> saying that these websites were a waste of IP space because at the time everyone thought we were running out of IPv4 addresses and uh, people didn't like that. Um, we started getting death threats and people would send us photos of our house. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so uh, we had to stop that website. Um, then we ultimately switched. So we thought, okay, you know, people... It was funny, but people weren't that into it. So we thought, let's make another website, but let's make this one about things that we're interested in. So, okay, what are we interested in? We're interested in drinking and we're interested in video games. So we decided to make a website we called drunkgamers.com. And that's actually what the Switch video was from. It was made, if you noticed at the end, it said drunkgamers.com. It didn't say red versus blue or rooster teeth. Um, so we made this website, and we thought, okay, what we'll, we'll do is we'll write video game reviews, we'll be video game journalists, and then people will have to send us free video games. We'll never have to play, <laughs> pay for video games ever again. What we didn't realize at the time is nobody wants to associate their brand with drunks. <laughs> uh, so we only ever got one video game sent to us, 
It was a game for the original Xbox. It was called Blinks the Time Sweeper. Yeah, it was a game about a time-traveling cat with a vacuum strapped to its back. <laughs> ten out of ten. <laughs> um, so we did that. You know, we made we ran that website for about two years, and it was at that point that Bernie noticed that uh, Jeff and I were, you know, making these websites on the side. Then he was also really, you know, influential. Really wrote a lot with us, uh, you know, on the Drunk Gamers website. And while we were doing, you know, while we were doing all this editorial stuff, that's when Bernie had the idea to start recording game footage. He was recording gameplay that, of himself uh, playing Halo and posting highlights. And this is before YouTube, so we'd have to. He would capture it, encode it, and then upload it. Then we'd have to tell people if you want to watch it, you can download this video. And if you download QuickTime, you can watch this video. It's a huge pain in the ass. And um, you know, ultimately. The the website dissolved. You know, we 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 had some creative differences. We decided, you know what, maybe this one's not working. It's like ugly internet. Let's just call it quits. You know, this one's not going to work out either. I think at our peak, we were getting, I want to say, thirty thousand views a day, thirty thousand hits a day, which is modest success. You know, yeah, that is good. Is like oh one oh two. Um, so then we shut up the website in I want to say like December of oh two. Then January of '03, Computer Gaming World contacted us, and they had seen the Switch video that I just showed you, and they wanted to put it on the CD that they packed in with the magazine, because back before everyone had broadband, magazines yeah. came with CDs and the plastic. Yeah, <laughs> and the CD would have demos and videos and stuff that, so you wouldn't have to download it yourself. So we thought, well, shit, we just yeah. we we're, they want that video, but we just killed drunk gamers. You know, what are we gonna do? So uh, we re-exported a new version of the video, and we thought, well, you know, Bernie's Halo gameplay was really popular. You know, we had made a trailer for Red vs. Blue at that point in September of '02. So we thought, okay, well, that'll be our, our new website. We'll make Red vs. Blue, and that'll be what we do for the next couple of years. So Bernie exported a new version of the video, put Red vs. Blue.com at the end, and you know, we sent it off to Computer Gaming World, and they, you know, they packed it into their magazine, and. Um, so then it went out, and we're like, "Well, shit!" Now we need to make a new website. <laughs> um, so then, because I I had some experience with uh, with making websites, I never told that story. I should have. I went. I used to go to math camp when I was in high school. You can laugh now if you want, because <laughs> um, I thought that I was really good at math. Like I said, I grew up in a really small town, so I was. I thought I was really big shit. I thought I was like the smartest person in the world. And then I went to math camp, and I realized I was an idiot. Uh, there were people who were way smarter than me, and so I would show up, and we would do this really advanced math. It was all like number theory and public key encryption, and I was terrible at it. So I would just hang out in the computer lab, and I would run like Mathematica and MATLAB. But while I was there, I learned how to make websites, and it was all like manually coding HTML and going into Unix and changing file permissions. It was a giant pain in the ass. And um, so I thought, okay, well, I'm really good at making websites, and it turns out I wasn't. So then I was like, okay, well, I, I don't know how to make websites. I'll focus on the server and the tech and the backend stuff because everyone always needs that. So since I had some background in tech, when we started up Red versus Blue, you know, I I kind of started the IT department and the tech department, managing all of our web presence. And the first thing I had to do. Well, one of the first things I had to do was develop a system where, if people wanted to, they could donate money to us. And、uh, it was like totally optional. We put all the videos out for free, but we just had like a little PayPal donate button. It's all like Patreon now, where you can support something you like. So I developed the. I used this system of scripts called Kiss, which was keep it simple, stupid. And、uh, so I just like read through PayPal documentation for you know trying to figure out how to get all these IPN notifications to work, and I never got it to work fully. So I would have to sit there and manually, anytime someone sent us money, I would have to manually indicate it on their account on the back end.、Uh, and the system was so janky that even though all the systems ran on Unix, I had to reboot them every night because there was a memory leak I could never find.、Um, so ultimately, I wasn't good at that job. <laughs> So、uh, we hired Adam Baird, who's our now you know, our current director of technology, you know, and he has done phenomenally with that. So I thought, okay, I, obviously my background's not in tech, my background's not in IT. I need to find something else to make my background in. So I thought, okay, well, at the time, like live streaming, Twitch had just started. I thought, okay, 
I'm going to make this my thing. I'm going to be like the best at knowing everything about live streaming. So I started at Rooster Teeth. I started our broadcast department, and it it didn't go well at first.、Um, our videos all had terrible lighting. I had no production background. I was kind of trying to figure it out on my own.、Um, some systems didn't work right unless you unplugged them and plugged them in in a very specific manner. I had a binder full of instructions and troubleshooting for if stuff didn't work. Like, oh, this is the 30 steps to go through to fix it.、Uh, tons of adapters. There was stuff that was plugged in that shouldn't have worked, but did.、Um, so ultimately, I realized, you know what? I'm not really good at this either. So、uh, we hired Patrick Salazar, who's our director of broadcast now, and、uh, he worked at a television station for years. So we hired him, and he came in, and、um, you know, really took it all and has elevated it to one of like the core pillars of the company now. So I thought, okay. I'm not good at broadcast either. I'm going to do events.、Um, so we wanted to. We had always wanted to do our own event. You know,、uh, whenever we were promoting Rich Teeth in the early days, we would always go to、uh, these conventions. We would go to anime conventions because there was a lot of、uh, parallel fan bases with people who liked anime, also liked Red versus Blue. So I thought I've been to. I've been going to events at this point for like ten years. Like I've been to enough events. I know how to run them. And we had always had this idea. When we were smaller and we were still at the in the bedroom, the one bedroom apartment in Buda, we thought we wanted to run an internet-based convention, and we were going to call it .dot com con.、Um, so we thought, okay, well, let's take that .dot com con idea and let's just make it into our own convention,、uh, just about us, and we'll call it RTX. So we had our first RTX in 2011, and it was kind of a soft launch. It was supposed to be about 200 people. And what the plan was, we were just going to do like some simple things. We we're going to rent out a theater. We we're going to do screenings at the theater. We we're going to take everyone through a tour at the studio at the time, but the ticketing system broke. And instead of selling 200 tickets, we sold like 650 in one minute.、Uh, so I had to. We had to go back to the drawing board a month before the event, and you know, redo everything.、Um, So then, and that proved that there was appetite for events. So we thought, okay, well, let's do this for real. Approached the convention center, got space. So then, in 2012, we had RTX again in the convention center, and in typical Gus fashion, nothing worked till the doors opened.、Uh, one of the the big pillars of RTX now is this thing we call center stage, where、um, it's kind of like a more accessible version of esports, where people can go up and play games and in front of a big crowd and. Developers can come and show off games that they're working on, but at RTX 2012, it didn't work until about 10 seconds before the doors opened. <laughs>、um, like Adam Baird was up there, I don't think he slept for two or three days trying to figure out how to put it all together,、um, and、uh, ultimately he did. So big shout out, thank you, Adam, if you're watching.、Um, so then we thought, okay, this RTX thing that seems to be working, let's try doing a different kind of live event. So then we started doing. Uh, a, a different event we called Let's Play Live, which was kind of like、uh, a concert but with video games. So we would take some of the people from our Achievement Hunter arm and take them and put them in front of、uh, a large audience playing games with lots of effects. And when I was planning that one, we had our major tech vendor quit one week before the show、uh, because they told me that the show was impossible and what I wanted to do would never work. <laughs> So it was one week before the event. We had to rescope everything and redo it. And I was telling the story again to,、yeah. right before we started.、Uh, when we did that first Let's Play Live, I never left the theater that that day. I never left the theater. I was in it all day long, from super early to like one in the morning. And I walked ten miles that day,、uh, just in that building, never never setting a foot outside. So anyway, after that, I was like, you know what? Not good at events either. <laughs> um, so I hired、uh, Bethany Feinstein to、uh, take over events. Now she's our director of events, and she's doing a great job. We have RTXs in London. We just wrapped up one in Sydney, and of course the one in Austin.、Uh, Let's Play Live does road tours now, and there's tons of other events. So finished up live events, and I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? So now、um, figuring out how to destroy everything Rishi does related to virtual reality and augmented reality. So in a couple of years, I'll let you know who I hired to replace me、um, <laughs> to to do that. So Rishi Teeth as a company, 
you know, when we started in 2003, like I said, it was a hobby. We never really set out to, you know, with this big corporate goal. We, I never thought we would be here 15 years later. Uh, we self-funded everything out of our pockets. I think we might have put like 300 bucks into the business because uh, we all had Xboxes. Bernie had made a student film in college, so he already had a computer and capture equipment. Um, so really, there was very little money. It was just a lot of time we had to put into it. Um, but the problem became that every project we made had to be a success. It's like when you're gambling and you keep pushing your bet forward and you keep hoping. All in. Right. All in. It's like you're, you're all in every time. And every project had to be bigger and bigger. And you know, that really stifles your ability to take risks and, and be innovative. I remember you know, when we started doing uh, Ruby, it was like, all right, you know, we're, we're all in on this idea. And hopefully it works. And now, you know, it's one of the, our big tent poles. It's, you know, it's one of the biggest shows that, that we produce. And it, it paid off. And I think it's, it's not often you'll hear people say this, but uh, I'm really grateful for, you know, we got acquired by another company. We got acquired by Fullscreen in 2014. And I'm really grateful for that because that freed us up to do a lot more crazy projects. You know, we were able to start making more films and start working on, on bigger things, you know, um, things like Camp Camp probably wouldn't have existed. Our entire 2D animation department might not have existed. Uh, and bigger projects like Genlock, which is coming out later this year, for sure. So it's, it's good. We have a little more breathing room now. And um, so I've talked a lot about, you know, positive and the negative stuff that, that led to get there. Did I skip a section? I think I skipped a section. So in the early days, I want to talk a little bit about the early days of Rooster Teeth. Um, it, was, it was a lot of hard work. I think now people look back and they say, like, oh, it's so great. It must have been awesome to, uh, to have started something. So, and it is. It was, it's awesome to be involved with something so great. But there was a lot of pain in the early years, and I found the section I skipped. Um, when we started Rooster Teeth, like, Rooster Teeth dominated all of our lives. We had no time for anything else. You know, when we first started, we were working our normal jobs, and then this was our hobby that we would do. So we would work eight hours at a normal job, come home, work eight hours on this, or, and then maybe sleep a little bit. Uh, so during those early years, um, I, I lost every friend I had that didn't work at Rooster Teeth. Like, I, 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 to this day, I feel really bad about it. Like, the only friends I have left were the people that I was working with 16 hours a day. Then even once we quit our day jobs, we all really fully invested into, uh, into the company. And, you know, thank you to my wife. She's not here, but she put up with a lot of shit in those early years. Um, you know, when we were working in the downtown studio, we would essentially work for eight hours a day on Red versus Blue. And then once we were done with those eight hours, we'd be like, okay, we're done with that. Now the next eight hours, we're going to spend working on live action shorts. And then we'd work for eight hours on that. So it's like, you, I barely saw my wife the first couple of years. And uh, she put up with it. And uh, I, I forget what year it was. I think it was in 05. We, um, we, we had just finished making Red vs. Blue episode 50. And I went on this vacation to Japan, which seemed really, looking at it from the outside, it seemed really idyllic and awesome. But realistically, I was just trying to get away <laughs> I was just trying to hide. You know, in 2005, it's before iPhones existed. I just wanted to go to a country where I knew my cell phone wouldn't work and nobody could find me. <laughs> uh, so I went to Japan and hid for two weeks uh, just because like, we were just really burning ourselves out uh, in those early days. And uh, I think that it's important. Like, I think the, J the Japan trip is one of the things that I think about a lot to this day because it, it makes me think about social media and the image that we all present publicly versus what we're going through privately, internally. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's healthy for everyone to remember that when you're looking at the highlight reel of someone's life, that there's a lot of shit uh, under that as well, and that we're all, we're all going through that. Uh, and like here recently, I, uh, after RTX Sydney, again, I took a vacation. I was in New Zealand for a week, and I posted tons of photos, and it looked great but I didn't post any photos from the night I got food poisoning, and I spent two hours curled up on the bathroom floor um, in cold sweats. So just remember, there's, there's other stuff that you're not seeing uh, that goes on 
uh, behind the scenes. Um, I never thought that Rashid would be around after 15 years. I think in the early days, we joked that, you know, oh, it would be great if we lasted five years. So, you know, wouldn't it be crazy if, you know, we got to a point where we had 100 people working with us? And, you know, I think we've far exceeded even our craziest vision in those early days. Um, in those first days, I was so unsure of what we were doing that I wouldn't make any big purchase. Like, I didn't want to buy a car. I, I, bought, I went to a used car lot, and I asked them what the cheapest car they had was, and I bought that because I didn't want to have you know, any debt or any, anything that I was, um, I was in debt to. Uh, and I had lived in Jeff's spare bedroom, so I didn't have to pay rent uh, just because I wasn't sure if I could commit to a six-month lease. <laughs> but here we are 15 years later, and we're still growing, and I'm still making new departments and failing at them. <laughs> Um, so, and, and I'm going to go on another little tangent here. Um, there's a lot of people who, who comment that, you know, we're really lucky to have started Rich Teeth, and, you know, we are. There's a lot of luck that goes into things like that. But I think it's also important to remember that you can change luck in your favor. I think you need, when you see an opportunity, you need to have years of failure and preparation in your pocket so that when opportunities do present themselves, you're ready to jump on them, uh, and you can try to make things work out. You know, if I hadn't gone to math camp and been bad at math, I wouldn't have known how to make websites, and I wouldn't have connected with Jeff. You know, there's, there, I could think about a lot of things that went wrong early in my life that led to other opportunities that presented themselves that led to, in, to me sitting here now. Um, like I said, I was a real shit when I was a little kid, and... <laughs> I remember this very vividly. I was 10 years old one time, and I had gotten a bad grade on a test. And I was really upset, and I was like, this is, this is you know, bad, my parents are going to be mad at me. And I was 10, mind you. And I thought, you know what? Next year, this isn't going to matter. And then I started thinking further, and I thought, when I'm an adult and after I'm done with college, I'm not even going to remember this test. And I don't remember what my grade was. I don't remember what the test was. I just remember thinking about this at 10 years old, about being, you know what? It doesn't matter. Um, so by no means am I advocating that people should go and, and seek failure and seek out to do things incorrectly or wrong. I think the thing to take away is to not be afraid when it happens. And that when a failure does happen or when something does go wrong, you know, you sit down and think about it and take something away from it. And, you know, don't just have failed for no reason. You know, use it and grow and take something uh, and keep it with you. And uh, keep that social media in my, thing that I said in mind when you're talking to other people and colleagues. Uh, not everyone's life is, uh, is all roses. I think there's a lot more underneath that once you start scratching that surface. Anyway, that's all that I, I, I really had. Uh, for my rambling presentation. It's funny you mentioned the um, going to Japan to get away from everyone. When, we, when I worked at Treyarch and we finished shipping a game, I said, um, I'm going to go to South America. I'm going to go far away from here where nobody can find me. I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go on the Inca Trail and uh, just pretend this place doesn't exist. So I told somebody at work this and they were like, I've always wanted to do that. And I was like, yeah. I said, can I go with you? And I was like, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm going to another country to get away from you people. And they were like, yeah, you, you can't stop me from going on the Inca Trail if I want to. So you don't own the country. I said, I'll push you off the mountain. <laughs> if, I, if I see you, if I see you there, I will shove you to your death. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, when, when, yeah. When, I, when, I, when I took my trip, I didn't tell anyone I was going. Oh. Yeah, you hide. I, yeah, I was like, like that morning, I was like, hey, guys, I'm going to yep. be gone for a week and a half. Yeah, where are you going? None yeah, of your business. Nowhere. Sorry, I'm not going to be reachable. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've got obligations, and you can't come. Yeah. I think it's, it's important to, uh, to refresh yourself. I remember when I was yes. on that trip, I also chose Japan because I didn't speak Japanese. Yeah, I didn't speak Spanish. And uh, <laughs> so I spent a week and a half, or almost two weeks in Japan, and the only thing I ever said was sumimasen, which is like, oh. excuse me in Japanese, when you bump into someone... So um, when I came back to the U.S., uh, I went to an In-N-Out burger because I landed in California. 
and I bumped into someone at the soda machine, and I said, Sumimasen. And I said, you know what? Excuse me. I'm really sorry. I've yeah. been out of the country. And it was the first time hearing my own voice yeah. and like really saying something in two weeks, and it was, it was really refreshing. It's fun. It's, it's fun leaving the country and uh, kind of getting refreshed. My idea when I went to uh, hike was I want to put myself in a place where I'll appreciate what I have back in the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a point when I was hiking when I was thinking, I came up here to die. I came up here to kill myself. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? I can't breathe. I'm, it's, this is awful. I wish I was at my desk. <laughs> and uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be like, I can't wait to get back home. I can't wait to get back to McDonald's. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was very similar for me where, yeah. you know, you get so frustrated and you become so focused on what's yeah. right in front of you, you lose real perspective. And I think leaving for a little while kind of reset me and put me back in a better headspace. Yeah, it's And uh, yeah, we're able to work for 16 hours a day for another five years after yeah. that. Yeah, you have to take a break. Mm -hmm. When I... Uh, when, I realized I had to leave the country when I first, um, I took a break and I said, I'm gonna play all these video games. And uh, I went home and I took a video game and I popped it in the Xbox and um, I immediately felt sick. And I couldn't figure out why. And then I started getting anxious and angry. And I realized that, uh, well, you guys know when the Xbox first started up, it had this giant explosion mm -hmm. and spinning around and everything. I had like a Pavlovian response to that that made me feel really sick because I worked on that every single day. And uh, I heard that every day. And every time the game crashed, I had to reboot it and then hear that friggin' noise again. So I associated that with pain. And... Uh, <laughs> So then I had to stop working on the Xbox, and then I was like, well, what don't I do? And I was like, go outside. I don't go outside. So that's what I have to do. I have to go outside. And of course, I went outside, it's like, hey, in the sun. Yeah, if you, if you're, if you don't go outside too often, it's, uh, yeah. it's a shock. Like, it's bright out here. Yeah. We're, so we're going to open it up to questions, um, and I, they're going to walk around with a microphone, and just raise your hand when you have some questions, and they'll come over to you. I see one mic over here. And I there think. should be one wandering somewhere over yeah, here. Yeah, over here as well. So we have someone over yes. here in the, in the back. Yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming here today. Thank you. Um, I'm Matt Schnell. I'm a creative writer. Um, when you moved back to the States from Puerto Rico and you were wavering between moving back in, moving back in with your parents and being homeless, how long were you, um, how long did that last? That was, so I actually the period when I was considering being homeless was before I moved to Puerto Rico. That was in 98. And that was, there was about a month period where I was like counting pennies, trying to figure it out. I remember that um, at the time I didn't have enough money to eat. So I would go to Wendy's and order like 99 cent junior bacon cheeseburgers. Yeah. And I would get like two of them and be like, I'm gonna eat this one now. And then in like three hours, I'm gonna eat that other one. And that's it. Ration it. But yeah, it was like rationing food. I, or I'd order like a pizza, a delivery pizza, and I'd eat like one slice and be like, the, I, it's one slice a day, keep <laughs> it in the fridge and try to ration it out. But it was like, it was like a month of like really trying to weigh out what my options there were. But yeah, but yeah, I, I think I stretched that $500 I saved for about three months and it was that final month where it was really, really tight. But yeah, I was sleep, like I said, I was sleeping on my friend's floor and uh, at this rent-controlled apartment, this really shitty apartment in Austin, and I would wake up like ev almost every night with roaches on me. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it got a lot better after that. <laughs> I had an orange tree in my backyard, so I was able to supplement my food mm. with the free oranges from the orange tree. That was always nice. Was like yeah. Free food. Yeah, it's Thank great. you, Mother Nature. <laughs> It's amazing. I can eat. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, over here. Where are we? Outside. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're blending into the wall. When you talk about your uh, prior experiences, predominantly the things that you've worked on, um, you talk about like the website and the live streaming, and um, you did it. You weren't. You admittedly weren't great at it, but like it's kind of like that saying, "Jack of all trades, but master of none." What advice would you give to someone like that who? They feel like they're all right at doing certain kind of things, but they, they struggle in like perfecting and like becoming good in one certain aspect of their life. I don't know if I'm the right person to answer how to get better at it, because <laughs> my, my answer what? would be hire someone who can do it. 
Um, but really, like when, when I was in the middle of it at, at any given time, uh, it was always just learn how to be more effective at using search engines. Uh, really, that's what it boiled down to, was trying to figure out how to find information as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, I didn't tell this story, I should have, but at one point before Rooster Teeth, I had taken this job where um, it was at a tech company and I was supposed to help them program their um, border gateway protocol into their routers. And it's this complicated protocol where ISPs share routing information so that when you want to go to a website, it knows how to get there. And I told them, yeah, I've got years of experience doing that. And they hired me to do it. I'd never done it. <laughs> I'd never even logged into the kind of router that they had. Uh, so they hired me and on day one, I just sat there with like the router config window open and Google open like side by side. And just like looking, like Googling and then writing, you know, code into their router and testing it and just like constantly trying to figure that out. So Google has always been my friend. Um, I see hands. I don't see the person with the mic pointing over here. Over there. Someone has a mic? Online. Oh. Online. Online. Oh, online. Oh, online. I, the online person has their hand up. I'm sorry. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, this is a question from Joel. He's in the animation degree program. What's a good way to find exposure for yourself or advertise yourself? Is it luck or is there a good way to do that? I like this question. Um, what I always tell people is, especially with the kind of uh, degree he's going for, is to just start making stuff. I think uh, having a good reel or portfolio uh, is really key. And having a body of work that you can show that what you're capable of and what you're passionate about. Uh, I think about... This isn't exactly animation, but I think about uh, Michael Jones, who works in our Achievement Hunter office. Uh, we found him because he made a video on his own that got really popular and got to the front page of Reddit. And we all thought it was really funny. And then we looked at his YouTube channel, and he had a huge history, a huge back catalog of videos that he had made. We thought, OK, well, he's obviously passionate about this. He, he's been making these videos on his own. So you know, let's hire him, and let's bring him in. And I know that we've had other people, um, you know, more specific to animation. We hired uh, Jordan Swears, who uh, heads up, who's one of the people who heads up our 2D animation department, uh, because he was making fan videos based on our, he would animate segments of our podcast. Mm. And it's now one of our most popular shows, is Rich Teeth Animated Adventures. And he doesn't work on that anymore. You know, he's handed that off to a team. And now he's working on some of our new shows, like Nomad of Nowhere. So I think just having stuff and making stuff. Um, is really good, and just you know, post it online. You'll you see if if it gets popular, if it gets traction, then people will notice it and they'll come calling. And I've I've had plenty of other people I've uh, I've contacted wanting to try to bring them on, but someone else will beat them. Some they they end up getting hired somewhere else. Variety is important too. You never know what somebody's going to like. Mm -hmm. Where are we at? Oh, right here. Hi. Oh my gosh. Just to like. I love you guys so much. Um, Casey from Mangaloo says hi and that you're awesome. Thanks. Um, so I want to know, where did you guys just really go, hey, this is a really good name, Rooster Teeth? No, they never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always joke that if I, ha if I had a time machine, the first thing I would do is go back and tell us not to name the company Rooster Teeth. Um, it, we thought it was funny at the time, and now I have to spell it all the time, and I hate it. <laughs> and it's such a long email address and domain name, roosterteeth.com. Oh, we, we wanted to buy, back in 04 or 05, we wanted to buy the domain rt.com. Uh, it was some German guy owned it, and I want to say he wanted like $100,000 for it or something. We we're like, we don't have that kind of money. We can't buy that. Uh, and now I think it's Russia Today. Like... Uh, owns RT.com, and that's what they use. Um, so the, the name originated, it was supposed to be a joke. The first Red vs. Blue trailer that we uploaded was uh, a video where like a narrator uh, is fighting with someone with a subtitler, and one of them calls the other a cockbite. And we thought, and people really latched onto that when we released that trailer, so we thought, well, that's funny, well, let's name the company Cockbite. Then we thought... <laughs> 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 right. So then we realized, well, maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, so then we thought, well, let's just modify cock bite. We'll t change cock to rooster and bite to teeth. So then that's how we got rooster teeth. Um, but yeah, it's just, 
It's, 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 it's a mouthful. Like one time I was on the phone with a customer service representative and she was asking for my email address. And I said, you know, roosterteeth.com. And she said, what is that? I said, you know, rooster like the bird, teeth like in your mouth. And she said, well, I don't have any teeth. And I, <laughs> and I said, but you, you know what they are, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what she wanted from yeah. me. This isn't a new concept. Right, it's like you, you're familiar with teeth. Yeah, there's dentists and things. Right. It's a whole job, industry. Right, I mean, I don't know in a husky, but I've seen it. Yeah, them. exactly. <laughs> I, I know what it is. Yeah, I know there's a moon. Yeah, a snow dog. Okay, yeah, yeah a husky, I got it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's, it's I, wish we, I, I wish we could have changed the name. I, I think Bernie disagrees with me on that. We talk about that sometimes. My name is Tucker, I'm in the Game Design Master's degree, and quickly I want to actually thank you because I learned about Full Sail from a podcast where you, Bernie, and Jack were talking about it. Oh, nice. So, um, so thank you for that. But so my... when, do, when do we get our commission? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know, they don't even give me a t-shirt. Like but uh, my question is, what, would you, what advice would you give to someone who doesn't do much because he's worried to fail? I mean, you're, go you're gonna fail. <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of like the... Hopefully, that was kind of one of the, the resounding themes that I kept talking about here today. You know, it's like, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Like, the, the failures are all learning moments. Uh, I think we all build up this stigma where we want to only succeed and everything has to be perfect and everything has to be amazing. But I think we should all learn that that's not always the way it works, especially when you're first starting. You know, I think you just need to put things in perspective and don't compare. If you're just starting out doing something, don't compare the work you're doing to the best in the field. No, the, don't compare yourself to people who've been doing it for decades. You know, start, and then eventually it's a path to get there. I think it's a matter of putting it in perspective and thinking more long-term, thinking like that little shit 10-year-old that I was about how in down the road, years from now, it's not going to matter. It'll, it'll get better. And failure, I think failure gets a, um, a negative rap. It's, it's really more about not getting as far as you would like to. But as long as you got farther today than you were yesterday and tomorrow than you were today, you were succeeding one little step at a time, and it gets you closer to your ultimate goal. So to fail is to learn, and to fail is to get closer to your goal. So don't be afraid to fail. Just fail forward. Yes. And up. There you go. Where are we at? Is it online? Uh, it's on oh, online. Oh, I saw someone pointing very emphatically. <laughs> it says, uh, this is Tyler Stab from Rooster Teeth's broadcast department. Question, oh, Gus, we are shooting Glitch. Please, right now, Ashley wants to know what you're playing. Okay, interesting. Uh, I'm, actually, <laughs> I'm actually playing Darkest Dungeon on the Switch right now, which I love. Uh, Gilby recommended that game to me. It's such a good game. Uh, I'm trying to re-platinum a New Game Plus run-through of Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, and what else am I playing? Of course, PUBG. I'm, I'm really bad at PUBG lately. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, some, something happened. I'm not as good as I used to be. I need to practice. Um, and there's something else. Oh, and then I'm also, I was on the trip to RTX Sydney. I was also replaying some uh, Super Mario Odyssey. Nice. So there you go, Tyler. And thanks for taking all these people's time. Yeah. Tyler, you can ask. <laughs> yeah. he, he, can, he can talk to me any time. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is Dustin. I'm also a GDMS student. Um, you guys have both touched on failing, failing forward, learning from it. What is one instance where you failed catastrophically, and what did you learn from that? I think my biggest catastrophic failure was failing out and not going to university uh, anymore. I, it's probably the biggest regret I have in my life is not finishing school and getting a degree. And I think all the time about going back and, uh, and getting a degree some, sometime, but I, I've never done it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was absolutely catastrophic. And I thought it was like the end of the world at the time. And, you know, it was, it was a matter of, you know, at, at the time, so I, I dropped out. I, I kind of skipped over this, but I moved back in with my parents for a little while. And I spent a summer just like really thinking like, you know, what the hell? am I doing with my life? And that's when I got a job doing beeper repair, which is the stupidest job in the world, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when I just like sat down. I was like, I just need to save money and move to Austin and then figure it out. And that's kind of what 
propelled, you, you know, moving out and moving on. So, I mean, it was, that was a huge failure that I thought was like going to ruin my life. But it ended up, it ended up working out. So yeah, Doug, finish your, get your degree. <laughs> um, my name is Tristan, I'm in the game art degree, and I was wondering, since you're, the kind of theme is failure and kind of recovering from that, has there ever been a point where you kind of hit rock bottom and almost felt like there was no way to pick it back up? And if so, how did you get through that? I mean, I think it's really like what I, what I just said, like not finishing school, and it was... Uh, it was a lot of just like hard introspection, a lot of hard thinking, just trying to like really figure out what it was that I was going to do with my life. And I don't know, it, it, it wasn't, it also wasn't like an overnight thing. You know, it was like weeks of really thinking about it and, and, and trying to put the pieces back together. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest one for me. And I think you figured it out early where you said when you were a kid, you realized that in a year from now, or two years from now, I'm not even going to remember this. I'm not even going to remember being upset or being down or anything like that. It's just everything you go up and you go down, there's an ebb and a flow. And, you know, you're here today and you'll be here tomorrow. And the only way you can get up here is by being way down here. You know, so you ride that roller coaster. And you know that it's going to happen. And I think it also, you know, having that healthy ebb and flow, it makes you appreciate when things are yes. going well. Because you can look back and be like, yes. God, remember when yes. I was sleeping on the floor and I'd wake up with roaches on me? Yes. God, I'm not doing that anymore. I freaking deserve this. <laughs> right. I made it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's good to keep it in perspective. Where are we at? Oh, over here. In a nice t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> I'm it's a Rooster Teeth shirt for those who don't see. Or it's, yes. a, it's actually a kind of funny shirt, but available to the Rooster Teeth store. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Willow. I'm in the uh, master's film program here. Uh, look out for my application. Just saying. Um, <laughs> you guys, you guys started out with machinima because you nobody knew how to animate, and you have your hands in all of these different cookie jars at this point, from you know animated to broadcasting. Now with feature films, you know that's a huge jump. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, speaking of failure and successes, and you guys were absolutely rolling those dice hardcore with each, you know, incarnation and with each jump. Can you talk a little bit about what it felt like to be in that position? I mean, you did a little bit, but like, each time you did it, did it change? Did you, were you more confident? Were you just as terrified? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think Please. every time, was probably more terrifying than the last time. I think, you know, uh, I, don't, I can't speak for the other guys, but I've always had like this self-deprecating sense of humor, like trying to put myself down. And then you, you kind of like, God, I'm such a piece of shit. Why is this working? Like nobody's going to, I'm surprised anybody likes this. I'm going to make something else, but they're definitely not going to like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of just like battling that little voice in your head that tells you like, you suck, you know? <laughs> You're not good, and uh, you know it's 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 something. Even after 15 years, it never goes away. I woke up at 3 a.m. today. I was like, I'm gonna bomb. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna go awful, and you know nobody nobody's gonna show up. And uh, it's yeah, I think the same thing applies. Like every time I was involved doing something new, it was always like, and then I, I, we had a good run, I guess. You know, and I think every time you're like, you're just convinced that that streak. I was just convinced that that streak was gonna end at any moment, and uh, I can't believe it's still going on. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tim. I'm in the Bachelors of Film. I got seven months left. I just want to say that I've been a big fan, and you guys keep me motivated every day with your content that you guys put out every week. Thank you. Um, my question is, is if I can get some meet with you after the panel and get some feedback on my resume, so that way I know what I can adjust and make it so that way when I go out there in the industry, I can have the right you know, resume look and everything. What a, what a great segue. Um, I'm gonna. I'm told that uh, I wanted to meet people after this out in the lobby, but I'm told that it's not big enough. So they told me to say that I'm gonna be over at the bridge. The bridge, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be able to see everyone's or like spend enough time to look at a resume. I'm gonna try to talk to as many people as I can. Um, hmm, I'm, I don't know. I'm like I haven't had to write a resume in 15 years, <laughs> so I don't know if I'm the best person to give advice on writing a resume. But I mean, I'm happy to take a look at it. But yeah, if you 
if anyone wants to chat, I'll be at the bridge for a little while after this. But I'm going to get hungry, and I'm going to get cranky. Then I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm always cranky. <laughs> That's my secret. Hello. <laughs> You're so that was the joke. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. So... Um, I just had a question about failure again. Um, what is something that you guys have made that you thought was going to fail and did really well, or you thought was going to do really well and failed? And also about failure, I tried to give you this book at RTX Sydney in 2016, oh, yeah, and that. I failed. Can I give it to you uh, now? Yeah, I'm stuck on the chair. <laughs> okay, there. I failed to stand up. Thank you. You tweeted this to me the other day, right? Yes. Yeah, I saw your tweet. Thank you. Um, so stuff that I thought was going to fail but succeeded was everything, like I said earlier. But stuff that uh, I thought was going to succeed but failed, I think early on the biggest example of that for us, and I, would, I, I hesitate to classify this as a failure, but I think the, uh, an, early thing, an early project that didn't work as well as we hoped was The Strangerhood, um, just because we, we had like, certain rules that we had developed as far as creating and releasing content. And one of those rules was we had to release on a regular schedule. But when we, were, when we began making The Stranger Hood and we were filming in The Sims, there were too many variables we couldn't control. So production ended up taking a lot longer than we expected. So we ended up with this uneven release cycle where we weren't releasing content regularly. And um, it just, that really just hurt that show. I think if we, had ha but if we had been better able to streamline our production, if we had more help, more people, there were, I think there were five of us or six of us at the time, uh, if we had more hands on it, we could have done a better job at it. And I think um, that's probably the, the best early example, best earliest example I can think of. Where are we at? Uh, hey, uh, right here. Oh, yeah. um, my name's Dallas. I'm in the Nice Sugar program. Pine 7 I'm... shirt, also available at the Rishi store. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I've also just, I'm a huge fan of you guys, Ben, for as long as I can remember. Um, I'm just wondering, you've been talking, obviously, a lot about failure. Um, I'm wondering more in the line of, like, how do you deal with the level of success that you guys have gotten? Like, do you have any advice for not getting overwhelmed and, like, the best way to deal with that? That's an interesting one. Um, oh, man, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know how to give advice on that. I, I feel like we've been doing this for so long that it's, it's hard to look back and think about that and think about what our headspace was at the time. I think, you know, we were very fortunate in that we were all friends and we all had a very similar work ethic and mindset when it came to how to approach projects and how to approach, you know, and the promotion. Like in the early days, we, we did everything ourselves. You know, it was just a core group of a few guys. And I think that we all really supported each other when it came down to like, you know, I'm having trouble with this, I'm having trouble with that. And I think that we really relied on each other to support and allow each other not to get overwhelmed. And I think um, if you were starting out, I would try to find someone, my advice would be to try to find someone to work with who can, you, not only you can bounce ideas off of, but who can help you share that load. Um, I think it's very difficult to work with your friends. I think we're very lucky that um, we all found each other and that we're still friends after working together for 15 years. I think that is probably very rare. So um, find one or two people that you, you really can trust and believe in. I find that it's a natural progression going slowly, and it's not until you get everybody in one place and you look at all these people and you go, Jesus, like, when did this happen? Yeah. When did all these people, like, <clears throat> trust me? Why are they trusting me? Mm -hmm. And they're all relying on me, and you'll realize, like, oh, my God, these people, I've, if I screw up, all these people are... Yeah. You know, going down with me. <laughs> Taking them all down. <laughs> and you're like, what have I done? <laughs> Where are we at? Over here. Hi. Oh, there you are. Hi, my name is Delia. Um, I'm doing the uh, bachelor's degree in computer animation. And uh, my question to you is, after a major success, how do you reward yourself? Ooh, that's a mm. good one. Go to Japan. I went to... <laughs> that... <laughs> That wasn't a success. That was Heidi. Um, <laughs> how, how do I reward myself? I don't know. Uh, I guess I, 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 I try to... These days, I'm very fortunate. You know, we have a lot of employees. I'm, uh, I don't have as much... I'm not, I'm not buried in 16 hours of work every day anymore. So uh, I feel like um, 
every day is, a, is an enjoyment. Every day is a reward. I, I feel I'm finally at a point, you know, this last couple of years where it's all like everything is amazing. And we have such a great team. Everything's been built out. Everyone works so hard. Everyone's sharing the responsibility that uh, there is never, it's rare now to have like that one sense of like, okay, we pushed through this one thing. It's always like, being shared everywhere by, by everyone. Do you ever make deals with yourself, which is like, if this goes well, I'll buy that TV. But if it doesn't go well, I don't get it. I actually did do that recently. Yeah, yeah I, I, I bought a TV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And you exactly. did the same thing? Yeah. She's pointing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I deserve this TV. Yeah. I, I, uh, 16 hours, this TV's coming home with me. Yeah, towards the end of last year. Yeah, I was exactly. like, you know what? I, I, I deserve that, it. I, I bought myself a new TV yep. after like seven years. That's my what last happened one. to me. Except when mine was a, a gas grill. Mm. I was like, you know, I'm going to buy a gas grill. Because when you're moving around and you don't really have stability, a gas grill is some superfluous thing that you don't need. And if you're putting it on a U-Haul, it's basically like a rolling bomb. So you're saying like, and it's one of those things where you're like, you don't need a gas grill. A gas grill is something, you know. So for me, a gas grill was like the pinnacle of success. If I could have a gas grill, I've made it. And now I was grilling up last night and I was thinking... That's right, I deserve this. This is my gas grill. First time I've ever had one. Nice. But I rewarded myself with the gas grill. Delicious. Steak. It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eating the chicken. That's right. It's nice. My gun. Uh, hi, my name is Cody Feltz over here on your right. Oh, there you are. Oh, there's uh, people over there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so you talked a lot about uh, your family. Were they supporting through all your failures? And if not, how did you kind of combat, combat that or deal with it? Um, it's interesting. Uh, I th- so I remember, what year was it? It was early in Rooster Teeth. It was maybe 05 or 06. Uh, my father was wondering when I was going to get a real job. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they, they've they been supportive, but not, in the early days, definitely not really understanding. And I think they've always known, like from an early age, that I was an unusual kid. So I think that they were probably prepared for that. Um, like I said, I, I didn't. I think they, they realized early on that I m- marched to my own drummer, and I because I w- any toy they would buy me, I would take apart and destroy, yeah. and uh, and I would just sit in front of the TV playing video games as long as they would let me, which was really really weird back then. But um, yeah, they've been they've been supportive, but if not understanding, it's a lot. You, you kids have it a lot easier nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> A support system's important. I think that's what gets you through the hard moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because when we started, I mean, YouTube didn't even exist, so people didn't know like about distributing video content. If you told someone, like, if when I was in high school, if you told me that I was going to start a company that would ultimately, you know, that could would be like a movie studio, but would distribute films on its own via the internet, I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> like, it just it, it didn't exist. It didn't make sense. So it's been uh, it's been interesting. I think I saw someone standing over here. Yeah. Uh, Carter and I, uh, Bachelor's Game Design. What was the first impression of uh, Jeff? Was it with the tattoos or was he a total dick? He, uh, <laughs> he was a bit of a jerk. Uh, he didn't have as many tattoos back then. He definitely had some, uh, but he didn't, he didn't have nearly as many. He was, uh, I think back then he had like frosted tips on his hair. <laughs> it was the late 90s. You can't laugh that much. Um, but uh, he, was, he was a really good employee at the call center. Uh, my first impression was I thought that he was cheating on his numbers because his numbers were too good. Like he was taking too many calls and his resolution time was too low. And I was like, this guy's got to be like trying to game the system. So uh, I was a manager at the time. So I would monitor his calls and be like, no, he's actually doing the work. He's actually like churning through all of these uh, customers and he's, he's doing a good job. Uh, so I, I thought he, he was a really hard worker and um and so we started chatting and you know we both had a very similar sarcastic self-deprecating sense of humor so we, we really hit it off uh early on so he was he was a, he was a good guy he still is a good guy <laughs> so i don't want to talk about him in the past tense <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna wrap up in a minute so we want to take the last few questions i know there's a couple of guys here who've been waiting to ask a question the whole time i don't know if we still have a a moment to ask a question or we're done oh oh no, no more no more. I guess you right. can. Sorry. Yeah. So I'll. Uh, but hang, you're going to be over on the bridge. I got by the bridge for a little while yep. until I, until I decide I need food. So right yeah. On. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah.